tell you a little bit about how I got to what I do and a little bit about what I do. So let me start with uh, how I got to what I do. Uh, I was an academic. So I went, I grew up in New York City, went to Bronx Science and uh, programmed my first computer in 1959. So that's a long time, 55 years ago. Uh, and then uh, went to, to City College. And when I was in City College, <coughs> Uh, we got our first computer there, and I programmed that. And in my last year at City, I was given a scholarship to MIT for physics. And I met with a, a Bell Labs guy, and he said to me, Howard, you don't want to go into physics. I said, why not? He said, well, he said, you're a smart kid, but Nobel Prizes are really hard to get. And uh, don't you like these computer things? This is the future of computers. So this is 1965 right now. We're talking about 65, 64, 65. And you know, I said, you know, I think you're right. So I gave up MIT in physics and went to Cornell for uh, operations research computer science. And uh, that worked out pretty well for me. I think I made the right choice. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if I would have, if I would have uh, been involved with the uh, Large Hadron Collider and all the great stuff that they're doing there. But uh, then I went on uh, to teach at Cornell for a few years and to teach at Caltech, all the time doing sort of early computer stuff. And in 1972, and these are all numbers that are so far <laughs> before you guys. But in 1972, I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania as a professor, both of computer science and of business at the Wharton School. So I was kind of in both departments. And I brought machine number 50 on what was then the ARPANET. So at that time, the ARPANET started in 1969, uh, which was sort of the, what started the internet. And it started with five colleges and universities on the West Coast, mostly, and Carnegie Mellon. Pittsburgh. So it was, and by 1972, it had grown to about 50 schools. We got, we were number 50 on the net. Uh, right now, there's five billion machines on the net, depending on who you talk to. So I was there pretty early, and, which means I've done 39 years of email. Uh, I received the first spam ever sent. The first spam <laughs> was sent in 1974 uh, by somebody at Digital Equipment Corporation which later became part of Compaq, which later became part of HP. This industry has a way of eating each other up. And, um, and it was about jobs available at Digital Equipment Corporation. And since ARPANET was government funded, they didn't like the fact that it was unsolicited commercial email. Uh, I don't think any of us at the time understood how bad spam would be today. Uh, right now, uh, my main email accounts get 10,000 spams a day because my email address has been so widely known for so many years, uh, the three that I use, really. And we get 10,000 a day that get filtered completely out. I never see them because we have pretty good filtering techniques. But it's become a monstrous problem, and that's one of those interesting things that hopefully we'll be able to solve. Uh, then I went in to do some, some stuff with hedge funds and venture capital in the 80s. Which, which worked out uh, very interestingly and started uh, investing in different ways, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that, which led to starting a company called First Round Capital in 2004, 2005, and doing, but all the way along, once I left the university, which my father, by the way, could never understand. He was like, you're going to give up tenure? Tenure is position, that's crazy. Uh, <clears throat> but I said, I'm doing the same thing. Instead of graduate students, and working with graduate students on product, on producing theses, uh, which have a 10-year time horizon, like we're trying to figure out what the science is going to look like in 10 years. I'm working with entrepreneurs, and I'm working with entrepreneurs on products and companies, and that has maybe a three to five year time horizon. But it's the same thing. You're nurturing good ideas and good people. And <coughs> what's great about computers, and particularly the net, is how much impact you can have. So in 19, 68 through 70, and when I was at Cornell, we built a compiler for a language at that time called PL1. And within two or three years, it was being used by a million people around the country. And that was kind of unheard of. And I kind of felt the fact that I had an impact on a million people at that point that were using a language and using code that I had written. Today, we have companies of ours that have hundreds of millions and even a billion people. So the impact has just risen so dramatically. So then I'm supposed to take a talk about what I do all day. And what I do all day is what you'd expect. Email, we're, we're sort of monstrously driven by email. Um, I get roughly 300 real, what I call real emails a day. I mean, 
forget the 10,000 spams, and then forget the, another 250 that sort of get through the spam filters and our newsletters and other stuff that's not real emails, but sort of 300 emails that have to be addressed every day. And that takes a lot of the time. Uh, phone calls take a lot of the time. Meetings take a lot of the time. But the most important thing is that I try to allocate every day at least an hour, so I try to get two hours, but it's hard, uh, to, for thinking and reading about ideas for the future and thinking about themes for the future. And it's one thing if you think about as you're going through life, uh, you should always on your calendar block out some time for yourself to think about the key I I items you want to do, but also to think about what you see as trends for the future. Because for me, it's trends for the future that become really important. Now what I do in a formal sense is venture capital. So what's venture capital mean? And venture capital in the US kind of started in the 50s uh, out of a group out of Harvard Business School and the Rockefellers did it for many years. It's basically investing our money, that is my partners and I, and other people's money, Princeton, Yale, uh, hospitals, Sloan Kettering, uh, but their money into new companies. So we try to find new great companies. And sometimes I do it personally. So before we started first round in 2001 and two, I met a fellow on West Coast, Tim Westergren, and he had a company called Savage Beast. And what he wanted to do was to, to take a project that Stanford uh, University had done. And the project was creating a genome for music. So he, he was a musician. And he had a couple of musician friends listen to hundreds of songs and categorize what they called the, the, the genes of a piece of music, or a piece of recorded music. And the genes included things like it has a treble, it has a, 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 a tenor, uh, tenor sax solo. Uh, it's in three-part harmony. It's, it's in this particular tempo. Uh, it's got so many voices on it. All sorts of things that you and I usually don't think about when we're listening to music. But, trying to analyze sort of the underlying part of music. And then say, gee, if you like songs like this, here's the genome of this song, here's genomes of other songs, but maybe we can find the closest matches. And that led to what changed its name to Pandora, <coughs> which now has 250 million users out there listening to music all the time. Now, as an investor, and that's what I, what I do, I invested in Pandora in 2001 and 2002, and it finally went public in 2012. So it took 10 years before I got any return on that investment. And that's not atypical in venture capital. The average returns come in six or seven years. Uh, but sometimes you get lucky and they happen really, really quickly. Today we do that in a company called First Round Capital. We have six partners, one in Philadelphia, two of us in New York, and three in the Bay Area. And Silicon Valley still has a huge lead on company creation and where companies are done, but New York is coming up pretty quickly. And there's a group here called Connecticut Innovations that funds a lot of Connecticut companies as they get started and invest in some of those. So what kind of companies do we do? I mean, all kinds, but mostly internet related. Uh, nine gag, I don't know if any of you have seen that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so the nine gag, I don't know if you guys knew 4chan, uh, which was an earlier one, uh, but it lets people post interesting things that they find. It's a little bit raunchy at times, it's a little bit, uh, but it came out of China, and this Chinese entrepreneur came to us and said, here's the plan, uh, I've already got in China so many users, I'm bringing it to the US, and he said, that kind of looks interesting. So that's kind of on the classic internet uh, startup, uh, something like PATH, which is uh, a, uh, another way of, of showing uh, pictures to your friends, and there's lots of ways to show pictures to your friends. We have Uber, which is the taxi cab company. I don't know if it's a Greenwich or not. Certainly, do they have Uber in Greenwich now? Just, just starting, right? Just starting yeah. up here? Yeah. Certainly all over the, the world now. We have 150 cities. Kind of changed the way people are getting taxi cabs. Um, something I saw a few years ago in Los Angeles, a friend who I knew said he, was, he had, was out of work for six months. And while they were out of work, he and his wife started dog sitting for other people's dogs. They would charge if they had a dog. And instead of taking the dog to the kennel, they would take the dog in. Uh, you've heard of Airbnb, which lets you rent people's apartments or houses in other parts of the world or in other parts of the country. And uh, dog vacay is basically Airbnb for dogs. And I thought it was a good idea. And so he and his wife started, they earned $40,000 in that six months. He started the company. 
uh, we now have a couple of hundred thousand people who've given their dogs to be to, for sitters, and, and another couple hundred thousand people who volunteered to be sitters and be background checked and all the other things you have to do. And here I'm someone who's never had a dog. I have one granddog now, but uh, <laughs> yet the idea was to recognize what would be an interesting business. And in today's world, there are all sorts of new types of businesses that keep coming up, and that's what you have to be alert for in, in my venture capital space, which is what is it that probably I would never think of doing in my, my own life, renting out my empty apartment for when I'm away for a week to somebody else, that would never occur to me. I mean, my wife would say, people are going to be in there with all of our stuff, they're going to trash the place, and no, it turns out that doesn't really work that way because there's reputation commands and other things that keep people from doing that, or well, at least dampen it quite a bit. And so people do it. So we said, gee, would they do it with their dogs? Yeah, they would, and they're doing a lot of it. Um, we have Warby Parker, which decided to change the eyeglass industry. Uh, we have Planet.com, I'll show you a little bit about that one. And the idea is to try to find interesting technologies, interesting people, and so that's, we do some of it as angels, some of it through first round, some of it through Idea Lab. Uh, Idea Lab, we created a project I worked on and, and started back in 99 uh, was Picasa. I don't know if you were on Google at all, but the Google photo sharing uh, app, is, uh, photo management app is Picasa. We did it originally because we felt people needed better photo editing tools and kind of recognized digital photography. Now, one of the things I like to say is that I've made a lot of money investing in companies at two stages, too early and way too early. So digital photography, we started in 1993 with a company called Meta Creations that was way too early. While there were a fair number of digital cameras coming out, there were no camera phones. A friend of mine named Philippe Kahn sold the company that he had which had figured out how to put contact information into a cell phone so you could store your contacts and not have to remember all the phone numbers you have at the time. And his company was bought by Motorola and he said to Motorola, in roughly 1995, uh, gee, I think we should figure out how to put a, cell, uh, a camera in the cell phone so people could have a phone, a camera with the phone as well. And Motorola, being a classic company, said to him, that's the craziest idea we've ever heard, forget it. And he said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. If you don't really like the idea, I'm gonna take it with me. And they said, with our blessing. So he did, and he patented the camera phone. Uh, has made a fortune from it, <laughs> you know, because it was the first guy. Everybody else thought it was such a crazy idea. How are you going to put it? Why are people going to want to take pictures with their phone? And that just didn't make any. So you got to be open in this in this world. You got to be open to new ideas. And once they did, and of course almost all the pictures today are taken with phones, uh, they needed tools to work with those phones. And the tools that we had created led to our creating Picasa. And Google came by just before they went public and said, "Gee, they wanted to." collect all the pictures in the world, and so they tried to. We have a few others that I'll show you some, some pictures of as well. So we have, about three years ago, we, we met a company and they said, uh, we're a group out of NASA, and we believe that uh, the way satellites are done today is it's crazy, it's way too expensive. We have a way to make satellites that are one-tenth the weight, and the way satellites work basically is all of the cost is launching the satellite is based on the weight. So if you have one-tenth the weight, you basically have one-tenth the cost. So they created they, what they call the Dove Satellite. That's a real picture of a real satellite. Uh, it's uh, about this big uh, with the opening thing. It's really small. Uh, and uh, they are using completely off-the-shelf software. So inside that thing is a Linux computer, a couple of uh, normal digital cameras that you, you, the chips are used in camera phones, a bunch of specialized special-purpose radios, and uh, it all, the, the Linux computer generates enough heat so that the coldest space doesn't affect things. And actually, colder is better for the sensor, for the camera sensors. And their idea was slightly different than the other people's use of satellites. Today, if you look at Google Earth or Microsoft's uh, era, you see pictures of the Earth and the satellite photos that are taken whenever. And if you actually dig down, you can find out this picture was taken seven months ago, and then you look at another street, and it was taken you know, three years ago, and another one might have been taken last week. They said, how about if we built a database of every day taking a picture of the same place on Earth? So they said, it'll take us 40 satellites to do that, running in low Earth orbit. 
So they are launching, they've already got 28 up there now, uh, 40 satellites. The way they do it is they, they put 28 of them on a pallet which run up onto the International Space Station, and the space station squeezes them out two, two satellites at a time, and they get them working, and then they push the next two out, and now we've got 28 running. And they are taking a picture, literally, of every point on Earth every day, building that database so you can say, write a program that says, gee, uh, show me it, for this geographic location what the changes are in the last week. So maybe it's agriculture, you're looking at growth. Or maybe it's the parking lot at a Walmart store, and you're looking at how many cars are parked there every day. Or maybe it's some geophysical thing. Uh, if it had been up early enough, maybe they would have had some clues for MH340, the Malaysian airline I've ever was trying to find. But it, the fact is, it's, it's completely sort of revolutionizing the way people are trying to do that. Now there's another revolution that we recognized at Ideal Lab back uh, about 2003, which was 3D printing. And our goal there was to get really cheap 3D printing. So we built a 3D printer that was going to cost $2,000, which at the time was a big breakthrough. It got bought by 3D Systems. But last year, Bill Gross at Ideal Lab and Steve Schell and myself said, what if you could make one much cheaper? So we launched last week a $200 3D printer. Uh, it's on Indiegogo. It should be uh, out sometime in, in, uh, in the either early spring or maybe a little earlier than that. Uh, it's a beautiful design. And what does it take to get a great entrepreneur? It's somebody who thinks slightly differently. Apples think different. Okay? So it, the, the expense in 3D printers is the number of parts and the fact that you have to move it uh, ahead in three, di three dimensions. You've got to move it up and down and around. And moving something in three dimensions with fair accuracy takes a lot of control and a lot of weight and power and parts. And we said, what if you don't move the head in three dimensions? You move the head in one dimension. Our head moves only up and down. And you move the thing you're building around. So that moves in two dimensions underneath it. So where, where the plastic is getting deposited or whatever the material you're putting down moves around underneath the head and the head stays fixed. Um, and it's, it's a different way of, of, of working at it. It turns out it dramatically lowers the parts count, dramatically lowers the price. Uh, and we believe we can actually make this thing long term for about 100 bucks and sell it for 200 and make a nice profit and sell the all the other stuff that's going on. So a lot, lots of interesting stuff. And the learning that we've got over the last couple of decades is that the way to make these things work is lean startups. There's a great book called Lean Startups and Technology. But the idea is, that you can do today is build a quick prototype, whether it's a web application or even something physical now with 3D printing. Measure everything you can. So whenever you build code instrumented to measure, measure what users are doing, measure what the code's doing, and then figure out what those users are doing and hopefully repeat that. So what do we actually look like, look for when we're looking for something new? And we have till what time, Matt? Uh, you have until 11.37. Oh, 11.37? Oh, yeah, that's we're long. Do we're going to get questions, too. <laughs> uh, um, by the way, I was a professor for 15 years, so if you have questions, just raise your hand. We can always take them. Take them. I'll take them any time. Don't have to wait until, until the end. But I'll talk a little more here about what we're doing, about what I look for. So what is it that I look for when I'm talking to a, a, a prospective company? And I call it the six Ps. And the six Ps start off with people. Right? Are the people interesting? Is it somebody I'm going to want to be meeting with for the next six years? Because that's kind of the average time frame. I want to work with for the next six years because there are some people who are really awful uh, <laughs> children to use uh, that, that even though they may be successful you just they just I just don't want them in my life I mean they could be successful in someone else's life uh, so that's the first plus are they people of integrity because I want to make sure that they feel comfortable telling me when things aren't going well as well as when things are because very often things don't go well or at least not in a straight line up uh, that's the thing we hope for but it doesn't happen so first is the people. And then comes the market that they're going after. Is that a big enough market? So I see a lot of products, particularly in today's app world, I see a lot of interesting apps that uh, are what I call uni, you and I, user, not investor. Gee, I would use that if you built that app, but it's never going to make $100 million a year company. Now. So it might make a $5 million a year company, which will do really well for the people building it, 
and you know, do really well for the users, of whom I may be one, it's just not the kind of thing that I can invest in with, for instance, money, or you would ask money, because it's not going to get that big enough to return. So is the market big enough? And then whatever the specific product I'm going to see is, I know that product's going to change between the time that they start and the time it gets out into the marketplace, because nothing, nothing survives uh, the test of real customers. It's, it's just very difficult. Do they understand planning? And that's not just financial planning, but scheduling, schedule planning. You know, the, the uh, writing programs is something that's really hard to do on tight schedules, trying to figure out how long it's going to take to complete a particular task. So do they understand how to deal with planning? In the end, I want to see profits. I want to see that what they're building could be profitable. Now, sometimes uh, <coughs> profits very, very rarely don't matter as much, right? Take a look at, at WhatsApp. You know, here, here you got a company with 51 people uh, that wasn't uh, initially making any profits, but eventually got sold to Facebook for $19 billion insane amount of money for a 51 person company. Unfortunately, only one venture capital firm got to invest in it, called Sequoia. We didn't get the chance on that one. Uh, and you know, even, even if we had, I don't know if we would have, because it was just another messaging app. It turns out that they, because of their focus on Europe and Asia, they grew to 500 million users with very few in the US. So it was not on the radar of most of the US venture capitalists. And at 500 million users, it became interesting to Facebook for other reasons other than profitability, just sort of control of all those users. But beyond those first four, which are kind of the traditional ones, there's two more things that I look for as a venture capitalist. One is passion. Are you passionate about the idea you're working on? Because if you're not passionate about your idea, then you're not going to be able to sell your customers. You're not going to be able to sell people into becoming employees. You're not going to be able to sell me as an investor. You've got to be really passionate about what you're doing. And part of that passion involves knowing how to tell a story. Because getting investors is really storytelling. Uh, you want me to, to think, to, as the movie people say, come along for the ride. You want me to get on for the ride for this movie, even though what you're seeing is makes no sense. So you really want to see that kind of thing happen. So do you have passion, and can you transmit that passion when you're speaking about what you're doing? And then persistence, which is, as I say, when things aren't going well, then you stick with it. And that's an even harder one sometimes to find. A lot of people want to give up too quickly. And that's not something we like. We want, we want things that will, that will stay and, and that you'll, you'll keep going and keep with either the same idea or something relatively close as you pivot, even if the first idea doesn't work perfectly. And, and that's important. So, in the year 2000, uh, Bill Gross at Idea Lab, the founder of Idea Lab, which I was the first investor in and a partner in, uh, we said, what are the right themes to invest in for this decade that, that just passed, the 2000s? And what we decided was that there were three themes we were going to focus on. One was more internet, because that was keeping kept going. A second was robotics. Uh, and the third was energy, because the energy needs of the country were going to be important. So we developed a couple of companies, one of which was called eSolar. That's a field of 5,000 mirrors. And each of those mirrors points to a tower. It's at the end. And when they, of course, we, we did this so it didn't point at the tower at that point. That was just for fun of taking the picture. But they normally point to the tower, concentrate solar heat on the tower, which, which uh, creates steam, which drives a standard turbine to generate energy. Uh, this is a plant that's running in, in uh, Southern California. And we worked with a bunch of players, and GE is now the biggest investor in the company, to try to get solar thermal, as this is called, CSB, uh, to be successful. And we weren't. I mean, in the end, the, it, it's still going, but it's not economically viable relative to the cost of producing ways. And for solar to succeed long term, uh, it's got to be cost competitive with other ways of producing electricity. In this country, that means natural gas and coal. And that means producing at a kind of six, seven cents a kilowatt hour. And this was more like 11 cents a kilowatt hour when you get it to scale. So 
rather than giving up, we've created a new company, uh, which is called Edison, E-D-I-S-U-N, that said, what was the problem with this? What was the cost problem here? And the cost problem here was that this field of mirrors, they're all embedded in concrete on big, heavy uh, uh, base, bases, because when the wind comes, you want to make sure these mirrors don't fly away and get hurt. So Edison's first concept was, OK, if it's wind that's the problem, what if we just put a little tarp over the top of the mirror that rolls, rolls over it whenever the wind gets above 25 miles an hour? So it stops the lift from happening. And yeah, you'll lose about 5% of the power, but you drop the cost dramatically because you no longer need the concrete bases. You just sort of drop the mirrors down, and uh, they're all, it's all plastic, and now it's, the, the cost has been cut you know, more than in half. And so that's where we're working now in, in a new thing that also concentrates that energy. We also said, what if we, instead of going for the 50 megawatt plants, we go for 20 kilowatts, enough to run a house, and try to do it so that you can stick this in your backyard, put these out on the, on the, uh, on, on the lawn, as it were, or nearby, and run your house. You know, so so we're, still, we're still working. We still believe solar is important. And I think solar will eventually, along with wind, uh, generate most of our energy as long as we figure out ways to store it. Because the problem is the sun, as you may notice, doesn't shine at night. Uh, actually, the wind tends to blow more at night. So the, if you combine solar and wind, you can get most of what you need. But you need better battery power, better storage systems for energy. And so we have a company that we got Bill Gates to invest in called Energy Cash that stores energy. So uh, it turns out there's a really cheap way to store energy. Uh, it's called a dam. You pump water into the dam when, uh, when electricity power is cheap during the day. And then when you need it at night, you just uh, open the floodgates and let the water flow over and run a turbine. Uh, well, one of our guys came up with an even better idea, which was instead of using water, uh, use, use heavy uh, barrels uh, uh, to, to get, create the potential energy. And what you do is think, think of it as a, a ski lift, where you're hoisting up concrete filled barrels, or in some cases barrels of crushed stone, and running them uphill. And then at night, when you need the energy, you let them roll down the hill and pull the pull the cord that basically is turning a turbine. Uh, it sounds a little crazy, but it actually works. And uh, the question is finding old mine pits in other places that have three or 4,000 foot drops where the thing becomes uh, economic. You know, so the building, building went over uh, in Asia. Yeah, you, you, can, you can look up energy cash. Uh, kind of an interesting way. But there's always room for more innovation in storage of energy, particularly today. It's not going to lead to the batteries we need for electric cars, but it is going to uh, lead to the, what we need for to massive power generation. And the batteries in cars are getting better. Absolutely. So what are the challenges you've got to face uh, so that you can build your company and, and I will try to find it? One is failure. And the reason that the U.S. is the leader in venture capital and the leader in startups and innovation is that if you fail in, over in Asia, you're done. I mean, you're, you're not only are you disgraced, but your family's disgraced. If you fail in Western Europe, in, in Germany, in France, uh, in Germany it's kind of 10 years before anybody will let you do anything again. You have a company go bankrupt. In, in France, probably never. The same in Spain and Italy. England's getting a little better now. But in the U.S., we're often funding people who we funded before, they failed once, then they succeeded, then they failed twice, then they succeeded. You learn from failure. And you know, here are some quotes. Henry Ford, failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. The more classic Thomas Edison quote, uh, if I find 10,000 ways something won't work, I haven't failed. Because every wrong attempt discarded uh, is often a step forward. Uh, and you know, he, he did, in trying to find the uh, constant filament for electric light, uh, do over 9,000 uh, experiments before he found ones that worked. First found Bakelite, that worked for uh, 20 hours, then he had to go find stuff that would work for uh, 100 hours, then 1,000 hours. He went through over 10,000 materials to figure out what he could do. And it wasn't failure. At Ideal Lab, we started 500 what we call projects. They weren't quite companies yet. And we start a project, and then if it works, we'll fund it a little more, and then eventually turn it into a company. But
but we've started 500 of those projects and we've turned 80 of them into companies, including some interesting ones like GoTo, which was the first paid search company. Uh, that was one that uh, grew into what's called Overture. And uh, along the way, we saw this company called Google Startup, uh, and they ended up paying $600 million for the patents that we had. They still became more successful, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a terrible, uh, terrible loss. Um, so, you know, right now, First Round has 220 active investments, and Ideal Lab has about 30. So I've got a lot of companies, and they range from things in the ticketing space, and we have a company that's helping solve sleep problems, and we did a whole bunch of things in robotics. You've seen, some of you have seen the uh, Roomba that goes and cleans your floor. We have something called the Mint floor cleaner that's competitive with Roomba, but it's, it, instead of randomly going around the floor, Mint does, actually maps the room first and then goes back and forth. And, goes, and that company was bought by iRobot, so it's now part of the Roomba, Roomba family. Uh, we had another part of that that got bought that found that another little problem, which was if you're in a supermarket and you put things on the bottom of the cart, uh, about half the time the checkout people don't find, don't see it. And some of the time that's purely uh, accidental, they just don't notice it. And some of the time it's intentional. They, you know, they, they, uh, their boyfriend has a case of beer for the party on Saturday night and they sometimes mis misread it and don't like it. But what, what we did at Evolution was build a set of scanners that infrared sit at the bottom of the of the lane as you're rolling the card in and a vision database that actually looked at the items not the UPC codes just looked at the items checked on the database and put them onto the register tape so that the checkout person had to actually actively take it off and that's now used by thousands of supermarkets around the country to make sure everything gets held and that's part of robotic vision which is you know, we think of robots mainly as the things that walk and so on, but there's a lot more pieces to robotics that have impacted all of the kind of things we do. Um, you know, we've, we've done things with, uh, with traffic.com, which uh, is up there trying to understand how traffic flows around the country. It wasn't ways, but it did, did pretty well. Uh, we created mint.com, uh, which uh, Intuit brought to manage your personal finances, and, and lots of other stuff. So the key is what Stephen Sondheim said in one of his songs. Having just the vision is no solution. Everything depends on execution. And what I mean by that is a, a lot of people will, will notice a need in the marketplace and will come up with a similar idea uh, in the same time frame. And you know, there were, there were a lot of things, a lot of social networks before Facebook. And some that got big, MySpace, it was still big, but it was over 120 million people when Facebook started. And somehow Facebook began to dominate that. So having just the vision is no solution. It really depends on act actually executing on that vision and making it work. And the best thing you can do is to speed up your time to market. And with today's tools, and you know, you, when you learn to program in, in some of you know, today's modern tools, and you have the entire open source world open to you. When we started a company called Infinautics in 1992, and I don't know if they use ProQuest in the library here, but it became ProQuest. Um, it cost us $5 million to get to the first product. We had to buy big computers. We had to uh, get Sun to give us the first four gigabyte memory machine. We had to license databases, a lot of programming. Oracle, pay Oracle for, the, for, the, for their uh, software. Three years, five million dollars. We got a product out. Took the company public. It did very well. Uh, one of the people in that company, Josh Koppelman, in '98 said had an idea that gee, you could sell things for less than Amazon. So he created Half.com, and that cost only two million dollars because by then we had some open source software, we had some better tools, and we were able to do it for much much cheaper. After he left eBay in 1993, uh, 2003, eBay had bought the company, 2002 rather. We created a company called Turntide that did anti-spam uh, routing, it was a hardware router. That only cost $750,000 to create because by then there was much more open source software. And in 2005 when we started first round, we were funding companies that could get to product for a couple hundred thousand dollars because Amazon Web Services had come out. And you no longer had to buy computers. 
and the impact of that has been massive. If you want to put up a web-based company today, you don't have to own or manage a single piece of physical hardware, except for your own computer that you develop in the software. With Amazon's cloud, with Microsoft's Azure cloud, with Google's cloud, with Salesforce cloud, you don't need to do that. And that is a huge set of expenses, people, time, everything. You don't need that. That's gone. It's now an operating cost. In terms of software, you want great databases, you get MySQL or Postgres, you get all sorts of open source software, whether it's PHP or Python, or all the HTML tools, and you can go quite a long way in terms of scalability with all open source tools and software, what people often call LAMP, LAMP stack, Linux, uh, and, you know, and, uh, and Amazon's for web cloud, and MySQL, and PHP or Python. So Apache is a web server. You can get there today. So that's making it easier to shorten your time to market. Because you don't have to spend three months arranging for your computers and your space and everything else. The third key thing is to listen to your customers. Because whatever you design, whatever you start with, it's not going to be right. And it's not going to be perfect. I mean, maybe if you're Steve Jobs. But other than even Steve Jobs doesn't always did not want it right. Uh, he, he didn't want an app store when the iPhone came out. He thought that. Would, would, would lose too much control. So he bought the App Store for a year before it came out. Uh, and then remain committed to excellence, which is the, the key. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Um, but I'm open to questions. If 